The art of color grading feels like it's shrouded in mystery. It's the secret sauce that filmmakers use to create that cinematic look. Grading might seem to be a big, intimidating, and costly process. And it can be, but it doesn't have to be anymore. Just a little bit of color grading can go a long way to create a compelling look in projects of all sizes without breaking the bank. Hi, my name is Dave Bodie for Envato, and in this course, you're going to learn the secrets of color grading. You're going to learn how to think about color, how it enhances and shapes your perception. You're going to see how colors are used, how they're used in a natural sort of look, and how colors are pushed away from the accurate and neutral into something that has much more pop and punch, or something that's highly stylized. You're also going to learn how specific looks are created, the steps that are involved, and what tools are used, like vignettes, highlights, midtones, shadows, contrast, keying, motion tracking, and more. By the end of this course, you will know what color grading is, what it looks like, how it's different from color correction, how to think about color in ways that you may have not thought about before, and you're going to see several examples of shots that have been transformed from something that looked ordinary into something much more interesting. To get started, check out the next lesson, where you're gonna learn what you need to follow along. In this lesson, you'll find out what you need to get started. On the hardware front, you're going to need a computer, a monitor, and an adequate place to grade your footage. I'm going to assume that you have at least a little experience editing, and if your computer can handle editing your projects, it should be fine for color grading. Color grading does not require the same processing horsepower as, say, motion graphics or 3D rendering. If you're wondering if your computer has what it takes, you can always check the minimum or recommended specs for the software that you intend to use for grading. If you're wondering about Mac or PC, you can stop now because it doesn't matter. I promise you, it makes no difference. Macs have been running the same hardware as PCs for 10 years now. Now I think dollar for dollar you can get a much higher performance machine on the PC side of things, but like I mentioned before, you don't need top shelf performance for grading. I only mention the Mac and PC thing because there still is, for some reason, this misconception floating around there that for high level video post-production work, you need to use a Mac, and this is simply untrue. It really doesn't matter. Macs are fine. PCs are fine, they both work in the same way, and they both crash in the same way. So whatever you feel more comfortable with, that's what you should go with. Monitors are a different story. Consider that you're going to be making your color and grading decisions with your eyes. A better monitor will allow you to make better decisions about your grade because it will allow you to see the colors more accurately. Now, it's not going to make the grading process easier or better, because that's gonna come with experience. Think of it like this. A lower quality monitor is not giving you all of the information. Now, how can you make a decision with information that you don't have? Now, in reality, it may not be that drastic because LCD panels are getting better all of the time. If you are looking for a new monitor for editing and color grading, I would recommend that you get an IPS display that gives you the highest color quality that you can afford. IPS is an LCD technology that has very good contrast and very good off-axis viewing. This is really important because with the older TN panels, a slight shift in height can affect the black levels and that'll make contrast a real issue because the older TN panels just don't have great contrast. With an IPS display, that's essentially a non-issue because they have a huge viewing angle. You will see some monitors that are targeted towards designers and us media people. Those monitors will list the color specifications and give you an idea of how well they can reproduce color in various color spaces, and you wanna look for the color space that you'll be working in, which is probably Rec. 709. If you are coloring for a digital cinema projector, you will wanna look for a DCI P3 specification. The size of your monitor should be dependent on how far you are away from it. My main monitor is only 25 inches, which is not very big, but it works for me because my head is only about 18 to 24 inches away from the screen. High resolution displays are something to watch out for too. 
For instance, I've seen a lot of monitors that go up to 4K and beyond, but a lot of times they'll trade color accuracy for more pixels. So if you don't need a 4K display, stick with something like a 1440p panel. That will give you 2560 by 1440 pixels. Even if you have an older monitor or you're using the screen on your laptop, you can still produce very nice grades with a little help from a monitor calibration device. A monitor calibration device is designed to measure the light coming off of your monitor and then use software to calibrate that measurement to a known standard. Now, you might think that your monitor already looks pretty good, and it might, but compared to what? You see, our eyes can deceive us. Don't believe me? Have a look at this image. The A square is clearly darker than the B square, right? Wrong. They're actually the same exact shade of gray. Check it out. This is an optical illusion, and I'm showing you this to illustrate the fact that our eyes and our brain try to make sense out of the world, and this can affect how we see things. For example, if you have a monitor that has a strong blue-white balance, and you look at it long enough, eventually it will look normal. Now this is not ideal for making critical color decisions. Several years ago, I did some color grading on a video for someone giving a presentation. Now, when I saw this video being played back on another system, I knew something was very, very wrong. I had made the presenter look like an Oompa Loompa. You know, from Willy Wonka, those people with the super orange skin. This was really embarrassing, and calibration could have saved me. So, calibrate, you must. Now, when you calibrate your screens, you might be in for a bit of a shock. I recently changed my office setup around and I removed a monitor from my desk. When I did, the calibration software reverted to a different color profile for my monitor, which was not correct. Because I was busy with a big motion graphics project, I didn't have time to recalibrate, so I let it go like that for about a week. Then, a week later, I recalibrated all the monitors and I thought something was drastically wrong because my main monitor looked really, really orange. I actually recalibrated it two more times and tried some different settings on my monitor because I thought I was losing my mind. But what had happened was I had become acclimated to the incorrect monitor profile and the newly calibrated screen now looked wrong. The truth was that the calibration was correct but my brain was wrong. A day or so later, it looked completely normal and I didn't even notice it. I recommend calibration devices that have both an ambient light sensor and the ability to calibrate the colors to the color space that you're going to be using. If you're using multiple monitors and you want them all to match, you might wanna look for a device that has a monitor match feature as well. Now, devices like that will cost between $150 and $200 USD, depending on the features that you are looking for. There are plenty of other calibration tools out there that cost thousands, but a basic device will do just fine. You're also going to want to think about the space where you are grading your footage, too. Controlling the space will go a long way in making sure that you are physically able to see all the detail in your monitor. The main thing you want to do is have a neutral colored space, so some kind of neutral colored walls, and controllable light sources. If your space is painted with bright, bold colors, that's going to affect how you are seeing. Ideally, you would have gray walls, but if the room has a very low saturated color and you can control the lighting, that may not be a big deal. But again, it's best to go with gray. Dealing with the light, is pretty straightforward. Do you have any windows in the space? If so, block all of the light coming from them. I know, this can be kind of a bummer if you have a really nice view, but you can't make critical decisions about the color in your footage with the sun streaming in your window. It's best just to block it all out, and that's pretty easy to do with some blackout material. You can buy blackout curtains, or you can buy blackout fabric and modify curtains that you may already have. I have found that the quote-unquote blackout curtains that they sell at the department stores or the home stores are not really good at blocking out 100% of the light, and they don't really work that well. 
for me in my space, what I did is make a really simple curtain out of plain old blackout cloth that I purchased at the fabric store and put it right up against the glass. This knocks out almost all of the light, but there's some bleed around the edges. Now, this is not really a big deal for me, but if it were, another layer of curtain can take care of the bleed. Once you have the window light completely blocked off, you can bring the light level back up using artificial lighting. You wanna keep the light level pretty low and out of your eye line and also off of your monitor. Even with a matte screen, reflections coming from a light source can be really annoying and drastically affect the contrast of your monitor. So it's something to watch out for. Finally, you're going to need some software to grade with. Right now, DaVinci Resolve is probably the most popular and one of the standards out there for color manipulation. Resolve is a wonderful application made by Blackmagic Design, and the standard version is free. Resolve is made to do color correction and color grading, but it also does some basic editing as well. In addition to Resolve, there's also some other great options out there, like Adobe's Speed Grade, Adobe After Effects, Apple Color, or you can use your editing software. That's right, you don't have to use a specialized color grading application. You can grade the footage in your edit application. And even with your editor, you have some options there as well. You can grade and color correct your footage with the stock effects, which are perfectly capable of doing just about anything you need to do, or you can use a third-party effect like Colorista by Red Giant Software. Again, all of the major editors out there, Premiere, Avid, HitFilm, Final Cut, and the others will have some tools that you can use to grade video. Are they as good as what you will find in those other applications like Resolve, Apple Color, Speed Grade, and After Effects? Well, they're all perfectly capable of creating fantastic results. The time it takes you to get to those results is the variable, and that's dependent on what you are working with and what you need it to look like. The point is, once you learn what you want to do with your footage, there are many paths to get there, and they don't all cost money. Once you have a little bit of grading experience under your belt, you will learn what needs to be done in one of those separate applications and what you can manage inside of your editor. Coming up in the next lesson, you will learn about what footage works best for color grading. Getting the most out of your color grade starts with good footage. And in this lesson, you will learn what that looks like. First, I wanna say this, not everything needs to be color graded. <gasps> I know, shock, right? Well, it's true. Some projects just don't have the time or budget requirements in order to make grading a separate step in the process. And in those cases, what you wanna do is get it to look the way you want in camera. If it looks perfect in camera, all you really need to do is edit it down and encode it. You won't have the latitude to do wild color manipulation with that kind of footage, but you weren't gonna grade it anyway, so it doesn't matter. For footage that you do intend to grade, you wanna take a different approach. Post-production video is an RGB world. The color of each pixel is made from the additive process of mixing red, green, and blue. Everything in color grading and color correction for that matter, is essentially re-exposure. If you want to warm up your image, for example, you're going to be increasing the exposure on the red channel a lot, the green channel a little, and decreasing the exposure in the blue channel. If you want to bring up the shadow detail, you are re-exposing the lower values in each one of the RGB channels. Now you can do this equally or individually, for example, you might want to give your shadows a little bit of a blue tint. This would mean increasing the exposures of those lower values in the blue channel while reducing the values in the red and the green channels. But why is this important to know? Because the main thing I want you to understand in this lesson is the more detail you have in your image, the more you can do with it. If you don't have detail in the shadows, when you try and re-expose them, it will look like mush. Footage with less detail means you have less room to push exposure values around before the image literally starts to fall apart. So what does footage with a lot of detail look like? Gross, usually. Let me explain. 
Take a look at this clip, which has a lot of contrast. Most cameras will record this image by giving the majority of the compression bandwidth to the brighter areas, and very little bandwidth to the darker areas. When you try and push up the shadows, it becomes a real mess because very little bandwidth or very little data has been given to that dark area of the image. This is a logarithmic gamma, usually called log. Instead of something super contrasty, we get an image that has the brightness values mapped so the darkest parts of the scene appear lighter and the brightest parts of the scene appear darker. This puts more of the detail in the zone where the bandwidth is. The result is a picture that looks quote unquote flat and lifeless, but it actually has more usable information compared to the super contrasty image. Log also works really well for cameras that record in a lossless compressed format or RAW. With RAW, nothing gets thrown away, so you get everything that the sensor captured. Now, given a bunch of options, RAW would seem like the most logical choice, but there are some drawbacks. RAW files have to be converted in order to be used in your editor, and that's extra time that you may not have. The sizes of the files can be massive as well, and that can be problematic too. The main thing you can do to get the most out of your camera is to set it up so that it's capturing the most amount of detail. So if you have a log picture profile or picture style, you're going to want to use that. You may even have a few log profiles to choose from, and that's going to take some experimentation to figure out which one will work best for what you are shooting. If you haven't worked with log footage before, you're going to want to make sure you have some sort of method for setting exposure accurately. Because log looks so flat, you may want to adjust your exposure up or down, and that can be dangerous because if you expose too far down, that's going to be really problematic trying to recover all of that information. And if you expose too far up, you may be clipping things that you didn't want to clip. So it's something to watch out for. Another thing to consider is how the video is going to be stored on your camera, or what kind of codec is going to be used to record the video. Again, you're going to want the most amount of detail possible, but within reason. For example, if you have the option to shoot between RAW and ProRes, RAW may just be a whole bunch of extra work, because codecs like ProRes and DNX HD with log picture profiles can work just as well as RAW with far less hassle because they can be edited inside your editor without transcoding or converting and their performance is very, very fast. Now what if you don't have an option to shoot in one of those higher end codecs, either RAW or ProRes or DNX HD or Cineform? What you want to do in that case is record to the highest bitrate possible because you're now getting into an area where the codec is going to be throwing lots of visual information out the window and you want to minimize that as much as possible. Now, it's possible and quite likely that you have a camera system that not only doesn't have those high-end codecs like ProRes, DNX HD, Cineform, or RAW, and also doesn't have the option to use a log picture profile. In that case, what you want to do is shoot as flat as possible. This means going into your camera settings and tweaking the picture to reduce contrast, saturation, and turn off sharpening. This will actually get the picture pretty close to what a log profile would look like because decreasing the contrast and saturation is going to lift the blacks and lower the highlights a good deal. Now, the image will look dull and lifeless, but it will put more of the detail in the zone where the bandwidth is, and this will make color grading a lot easier. Exposure is another thing to consider when you're shooting for a grade. As I mentioned before, very little bandwidth is given to the darkest parts of the image. So if there is shadow detail that you want to see, you're going to want to expose to the right if you can. This means if you have room to increase the exposure while you are shooting without clipping important details, you should. You can always darken an image in post in a very clean and subtle way. But if you're trying to increase the exposure in the shadows, it usually looks worse. Now, I want to make sure that I stress this, but if you are going to try and increase the exposure to capture more of that shadow detail, that you do it very carefully and you don't clip your highlights too badly or you don't clip important information too much. So to review, 
Use a log picture profile if you have it and know how to expose for it. If you don't have a log picture profile, use an option to flatten out your picture profile on your camera by reducing contrast, saturation, and turning off sharpening. Use the highest bitrate codec that you have and for darker scenes, expose to the right where appropriate and watch out that you don't clip those highlights. Now that you know how to shoot for a color grade, you're ready to move on to the next lesson, where you're going to learn exactly what color grading is all about and why you need to do it. Color grading is a specific part of the post-production process, and in this lesson, you'll find out exactly what it's all about. There is a lot of confusion about color grading and color correction. At their core, they're both about pushing pixels around and altering exposures and color but they have a unique function. Color correction is a process where you take your clips and you match exposure, color temperature, and saturation so that all of the clips look relatively uniform. Color grading is more of a creative process where you make choices about the exposure, color temperature, and saturation to support the emotion of the sequence and provide continuity. They also go in that order. Color correction first, then color grading. The reason for this is that trying to do color correction and color grading on each clip individually can get very complicated and it involves extra steps. For example, let's say in order to correct clips in a sequence, you need a three-way color corrector, a fast color corrector, and a curves adjustment. Then for the color grade, you need another three-way color corrector and a curves. For every clip, you would have to adjust at least five effects, and that is a recipe for inconsistency and headaches. A better way to do it is to do all of your color correction first, then go back and apply the color grading to the scene more globally. Because the shots were matched pretty well in the color correction process, this color grading process will go a lot faster. You might even be able to use something like an adjustment layer or similar to apply some blanket grades and then tweak a few clips individually. So color grading happens after color correction and color correction happens towards the end of your project. You don't need to worry about the color of clips and shots that are going to be edited out. In general, the edit coloring workflow goes something like this. You import your footage, you organize it, you trim your clips, make sub clips, do a rough assembly, refine your edit, do your color correcting, then do your color grading, do your sound mixing, add your titles, and then export your project. This order of operations can definitely have some flexibility, but I would bet that it's the most efficient way to tackle most of your projects. So right now you are looking at DaVinci Resolve, and you're going to see a lot more of this coming up in the next few lessons. So I've gone over what color grading is and how it's different from color correction, but we haven't really talked a whole lot about why you want to do color grading. Now, before we look at some examples of why you'd want to do some color grading, I want to show you something really quick about color correction and color grading. Sometimes, depending on the footage, the line between color correction and color grading gets a little blurred. If your footage is less than ideal, like these few clips right here, then the lines between color correction and color grading become a little bit more blurred because you're doing more than your typical color correction passes. So for example, these three shots right here are not what I would call ideal. This is a project that I shot several years ago, super fast with um, one of the very, very first kind of prosumer HD cameras. And you can see that each one of these has just a little bit of craziness going on with the color. Now, it all can be color corrected, but the amount of steps that it takes to do that can seem like we're getting into the territory of kind of color grading because color grading sometimes is a more isolated process where we're not making big sweeping changes. We're kind of making very specific changes to parts of the image. But the point is, Sometimes you do need to do more in the color correction process. Sometimes it's just a single adjustment. Sometimes it's many adjustments and you have to pull keys and motion track. This shot was motion tracked to help pull a better key. And sometimes that sort of thing needs to be done in order to correct the shot. And things like pulling keys and motion tracking 
are typically things that you do kind of in the color grading stage, but sometimes they have to be done in the color correction stage. So I just wanted to show you that sometimes color correction is more involved and it will take uh, more work than what you typically think of as a quick color correction. So now I have another project in Resolve loaded, and I want to show you some examples of why you might want to color grade. So check this clip out right here. This is a nice drone shot here of some water and a beach. Now it already has a basic color correction applied to it, but let's say that you wanted to fit this clip in with a tropical island scene. Well, here's a color grade that I did on this clip to give it more of a tropical island vibe. You can see right away, there's a huge difference to the water. It has much more of a blue tone. The sand has a much warmer, more highly saturated, rich feeling to it. And this would be a great example of what you might want to do to a clip to make it fit within your project. Let's say you needed to fit the same clip in with a whole bunch of footage that was shot at night. This might be something that would work in that sort of situation. You can see that this has a real kind of moonlit vibe to it. Maybe you could use a little bit more blue in the highlights, but you can see the idea here is the look is completely changed. And why would you do that? Well, you would do that to make it fit with the rest of the shots in your scene. So let's check out this next clip here. By the way, all of these clips are stock video clips that I got from videohive.net. This original shot here came, I'm pretty sure this was direct off the camera. I could tell by the file name and you can see that it looks like it needs some help. It needs some color correction because it's pretty crushed out. It's got a good amount of contrast, right? You can definitely tell that this lighting strip here is clipped completely and it looks like a lot of detail is lost uh, down here, but actually with a little bit of color correction, you can't really recover this stuff, but you can bring back a little bit of the detail here in her shirt that wasn't there before. So why would you want to color grade this shot, right? This is a pretty decent looking shot here with a little bit of color correction. It balances out the colors, it balances out the exposure. Well, let's see what a basic grade looks like. Boom. This is definitely stylized, it's more saturated, and I think your eye is drawn a little bit more towards our hero here, the one that's running away from the camera. And that's because I've done a little bit of kind of digital relighting here, where I've put a little mask around her and darkened everything else down and brightened her up. And so that kind of helps draw your eye when before it looked like this. Right? I mean, this is a little bit heavy handed to be sure, but it definitely draws your eye more towards this side of the frame. Same thing here. This is the color corrected version. You can see a ton of noise down here in the shadows. That's because this is what the original clip looked like. And you can see that there's just almost no detail down there whatsoever. And that's a prime example of what I was talking about in the previous lesson how you may want to shoot with a flatter profile or maybe add some more lighting down here or maybe just expose this up because you really want the skin tones to be exposed properly and they're not really. So a little bit of color correction fixes that, but you can see it does look pretty flat now. The color is pretty good and it matches the other shot. Well, let's see what a basic grade looks like. Lots of contrast, lots of saturation in her and your eye is drawn much more towards her and off the background. You can definitely see that she's the focus here where this is much, much, much flatter. Here's another nice example. And you might say, well, this already looks pretty good. It's got great contrast, but there are some things that I am noticing here. For example, this red salt shaker and these red food items are really super saturated and I would like my characters here to be the focus. And so to do that, a little color grading magic happens where we're drawing the eye into our characters here. We're warming them up, giving it a nice kind of evening vibe here, taking some of the blue onto the background, kind of warming that up. And all of these are creative decisions. I wanted to do that because this looks fine, but I think this looks a lot better, especially when you see this in motion here. If you watch our characters, 
this looks a lot nicer than this. Look at these red elements right here. You can see right now they're really pretty saturated. And I took the saturation right down and boosted the saturation on our characters here. So not only is color correction a creative thing where you're trying to create a look to match another scene, another setting, another environment, but there's also a lot that can go into it to help draw the attention to the main element. A lot of times that's done in lighting and composition, but that is helped quite significantly in color grading. So some of color correction is to make your footage fit in a particular environment, you know, kind of a jamming a square peg in a round hole sort of thing, where you need a shot to match a shot that was in a completely different light or a different situation or scene or setting or whatever. And sometimes you just need to refocus the eye. So there's a lot of different reasons why you might want to color grade your images. And all of that helps to tell better stories. Coming up in the next lesson, you're going to learn how to evaluate color and imagine a look. So check that out coming up next. Color is shorthand for feeling. It sets the tone and the context for your whole project. And in this lesson, you will learn how to use color to create that feeling. For some of you artsy folks out there, this color equals feeling relationship makes a lot of sense. For more technical folks, like myself, you really have to think about it. I mean, we see color every day, in the real world, on TV, and in the movies, but you may not have given it conscious thought. That's probably because whatever you were watching on TV and in the movies was so well done that the color grading blended into the background and the story. That's the really good stuff. And color grading has that power to make you feel things that you didn't know that you were feeling. It also has the ability to tell your brain, hey, hey, look over here. This thing's really important. Pay attention to this thing right here. Let's play a little game. Close your eyes for a moment and think about these feelings. Really, it'll work better if you close your eyes. Warm, happy, fun, uplifting, new, adventure. With your eyes still closed, imagine what the world looks like. What does the sky and sun look like? What do the clothes that people are wearing look like? What do the plants look like? You can open your eyes now. I was imagining a bright yellow sun and a blue bright sky. The clothes that people were wearing were vivid colors. Everything was very bright looking, and the plants had very green leaves. Let's try this again. Go ahead and close your eyes and think about these feelings. Cold, desolate, loneliness, anger, sadness, fear. What does the world look like? What does the sky and the sun look like? What do the clothes that people are wearing look like? What do the plants look like? You can open your eyes now. I was imagining a really dull sky, kind of maybe even smoggy, brown or gray clothing, kind of dirty, no bright colors, a lot of dark tones. And the plants weren't that bright green as before. In this world, they're kind of olive colored, maybe even brown. This is what I'm talking about. Colors really do matter, and they can help to really sell a feeling. And that is really important for telling your story. Now, what if you struggled with that game? What if you heard those feelings and you thought, hmm, that's okay. This is not something where you have to reinvent the wheel. One thing that can help, even if you're good at that game, is to assemble some reference images and maybe even create a mood board. A mood board is a collection of images, fabrics, colors, or even text to help you visualize and work out the color concepts for your project. When you start assembling your images and your colors and your textures, you'll have a real idea of what works to support your feeling and what doesn't. And once you have those things kind of refined down, you can get an idea of the color palette that you can use for your project. Now this can be the color set that you use for a particular scene, or it can work for the whole film. Sometimes this 
color palette is referred to as creating a quote unquote look. Sometimes this look can have a very natural, normal looking vibe to it. And then other times it can be very highly stylized. It really depends on your project and what you're trying to do. And most importantly, the emotions and feelings you're trying to promote in your film. You're going to see examples of those looks coming up in the next few lessons, both natural and highly stylized. In addition to those looks, you're also going to see some of the other elements that go into color grading. Things like relighting, vignettes, tracking, sharpening, and noise and grain. So check that out coming up next. Color supports content. Just because a shot is technically corrected doesn't mean that it will necessarily feel right for the scene or your production. In this lesson, you're going to see an example of how to use color grading to create a continuity of feeling. So let's imagine that these three clips are part of a longer video. So there's a scene here in the car, then later there's a scene here in a bathroom where the main character is getting his hand bandaged. And then later still we have another scene where we have this man here trying to figure out how to knit a doily. I'm not saying this would be a great film, but I'm going to show you what I did with color grading to make these shots look more like they are part of the same story. What I did is in each one of these, I came up with a color grade. And it is a little bit heavy handed, but I wanted to make sure that you were getting the idea here. So just look at how these shots flow together now. You can see that there's kind of a similar tonality going on in each one of these shots. It's for the most part somewhat natural. What I wanted to do is match everything to this shot here. I came up with a basic grade on this shot, a little vignette, a few other little tricks going on here, but this shot still has a lot of purple in it. And so what I wanted to do is take the other shots and give them some of those same tones. So some cooler tones and some warmer tones, because we have a lot of warm tones in here. This wall's warm, their skin is warm, right? Jess has this blonde hair here. That's a nice warm color. But we have this purple wall over here. And so I wanted to also give it a little bit of color contrast. So I, I push the shadows just a hair towards blue. By taking these other shots and giving them a very similar treatment, I think it has a better uh, kind of flow to it. So let me show you what went into creating this color grade here. I'll just back off each one of these nodes here. In DaVinci Resolve, you can do a lot of things in a single step, but it's much easier to use multiple steps so that you can kind of keep track of your ideas. And each one of these little boxes here is called a node. And so each one of these has kind of a separate color grading idea in it. So after the base color correction, which is right here, I created a little shape here. It's called a power window here in Resolve. And I pulled my main characters out a little bit. I brought up the highlights a little bit. I brought up the midtones ever so slightly, and I juiced the contrast and adjusted where that contrast point was just to punch them out just a little bit. Because without this, I think that it just looked a little bit too dark. So in the next step, what I did is basically the opposite. I have this mask here, this key that I pulled with this power window feeding into this next node here. And so what I'm doing here is the opposite. So right now I have the outside of that shape selected. And what I'm doing here is darkening that down. I have the midtones pulled down just ever so slightly and I'm desaturating it just a little bit because I want kind of the focus of the saturation to be right in this zone here. Then in the next step, what I was doing is taking care of some problem elements. You can see I have an orange Nike box and a red inspection sticker here. And to me, those stuck way out because they're quite a bit more saturated than uh, some of these other elements here. If you look at the vector scope here, this shows kind of where the saturation falls and orange is right here. And so the the bigger the blob in the direction of a particular color means the more it's saturated. And so watch what happens when I take out the saturation of this box and the sticker. Bloop! It goes away. I really didn't want that to be the focus because that happens to be the most saturated thing in this scene. In the next step here, what I did is punch a little bit of a vignette around the whole thing 
So I have this shape layer here, and it's basically just affecting the outside area. Anything that's gray here is not being affected, and the pixels that you can see are being affected. And so I'm pulling this down. I'm pulling down the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows just a little bit. Go back to my waveform here so you can see the difference. And I'm taking the shadows and I'm pushing them towards blue ever so slightly so that it gives a little bit of kind of cooling off um, because it makes a nice color contrast to have this kind of cyan color against the skin tones of our people here. It gives it a little bit more punch. And then the final step, what I did is I took all of the shadows overall and I pushed them just a little bit kind of blue purple. And then to compensate for that, I pushed the midtones back towards orange just a little bit. In this particular program, when you make changes to either the shadows, which is called lift, the midtones, which is called gamma, or the highlight area, which is called gain, these have huge overlaps. So the shadow area here actually affects um, the entire picture all the way up to the very, very top. It, it tapers off in its kind of uh, weight, so it's much more affected down here than it is kind of up here near the highlight area, but it does affect almost the entire tonal range. In this middle shot here, what I did to come up with a grade was quite similar. So this is the initial color correction. And in the next node, I did a little bit of an adjustment to push the shadows just the tiniest bit towards blue. It looks like a, a quite a large adjustment, but um, really it's it was a very small adjustment. Then in the next node, what I did is I created a shape here to isolate my main two characters, and I motion tracked that through the frame here. And what I've done is give this a little bit more contrast by juicing the highlights and the midtones and pulling down the shadows just a little bit, and also moving those highlights ever so slightly towards orange and away from blue, just to warm them up just a hair. I'll take this mask off so you can see just a little bit better. And then in the final step, what I did is I created a vignette here to kind of focus the eye and do that same kind of blue push to those shadows just a little bit. And then in this final shot here, I thought the tones actually matched pretty good, these kind of mid-tones here, but it doesn't have any of those lower kind of purpley bluish notes from the previous shots. So um, basically what I did is I created a still here and I applied some of the same color correction that was in this previous shot. I applied some of those elements over here. So that final vignette, instead of being right in the center, what I did for this shot to kind of match the tones, and it's pretty subtle, is I motion tracked it. So it goes right along with the character in this shot here. Now this does look pretty heavy handed when you see it kind of clicked on and clicked off, but I think in the sequence here, it does work pretty well. Coming up in the next lesson, you're going to see a few more really quick examples of this natural style color grading to really enhance the look of a few shots. Now, unlike the examples you saw in this lesson where the colors were pushed around a little bit, some of the shadows pushed just the hair towards the cool and the midtones towards warm, in the next example, you're going to see a really dramatic transformation of a few shots using primarily only exposure. So the colors aren't going to be really pushed one way or another, but the highlights, midtones, and shadows are going to be adjusted, and the result is pretty dramatic. So check that out coming up next. In this lesson, you're going to see a few more examples of this natural style color grading, but in these grades, I'm primarily going to be using exposure adjustments in the shadows, midtones, and highlights in combination with masks and motion tracking. Let's take a look at another quick example here. This is a little bit more simple. I have two shots here of the saxophone player. Now these shots, I think, look pretty good on their own. Now they are color corrected, so you can see what they look like without color correction. So a little bit of color correction normalizes the colors and helps them to work together. So let me show you what I came up with for the grades for each one of these shots. 
At first glance, they may seem a little bit drastic, but let me play them down for you so you can see what they look like. So once you see them played, you kind of forget about what it looked like before. But if I bounce back to the pre-grade, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference there. This looks very flat, and now it looks like he was kind of extra lit here, which is what I was going for. Same thing in this version here. When I take off the grade, it, it almost looks like it's lit in reverse, like he's purposely not being lit, but this wall here is. But now it kind of puts the focus back on him. So let me back it back down to the base color correction here, sometimes called a base grade. In this node, I'm tracking his body and also his horn, although I didn't spend a ton of time tracking his horn, and his face. The idea was I want to get this area right here and I want to isolate that so I boost up the tones that are in this area. And then in the next node, what I'm doing is basically doing the opposite. I'm taking the tones that are outside this area, and I'm pulling them down. And then finally, in the last node, this is just a basic gradient. And it's got some animation to it because the camera does a little bit of a move. I don't think I tracked it. No, it's not tracked. But it is. it does have some keyframe animation here to kind of line up with the frame a little bit. And a lot of times for moving shots, you do have to do some of that if you're going to use these masks. You do have to kind of track or make sure you are doing some kind of animation. Otherwise, you get a window here that sort of sticks in the frame and then the camera moves or your subject moves and it's very obvious what's going on. It doesn't line up. So you do have to do a little bit of wizardry. It's really not that big a deal, especially in Resolve. So a little bit of gradient here, and that's just taking down the shadows a touch, the midtones a touch, and uh, a little bit more of the highlights here to draw the eye in. Pretty much the same thing is going on here for this second shot. The same idea. Not a lot was done to the colors, really. It's mostly kind of leaving the colors where they are, because I like the skin tones, but figuring out a way to punch up my subject to basically enhance the story by getting the eye to go where I want it to go. And so if we look at this node here, I have a couple of masks. I have this kind of uh, circle-y mask, or it's called a power window here in Resolve. Then I have this one that kind of tracks this part of his horn, and then one that goes over the bell of his horn here. These are motion tracked. Uh, right here in Resolve, and then I hand tweak them a little bit, but you can see they generally stick pretty well. So I'll make these invisible for a second, but just so you can see what this is doing, it's actually doing quite a lot. Um, this particular node here is darkening things down, so mostly in the midtones, a little bit in the shadows, but just look at the effect that it has on his horn. You can see that there, it's kind of almost relighting this because of the way that the shape was created and, and the feathering of the horn here on this um, bell part, this uh, <laughs> the last part of his saxophone here. It's adding a good bit more shading there, which really makes that kind of punch right out. And then in the next node, what I was doing is basically the opposite. And so in this node right here, what I'm doing is bumping up the highlights and a little bit of contrast too. So you can see that this does make a huge difference. It really gives it that punch in that life. Finally, in the last node, this is adding just a little bit more saturation. If we look on the vector scope here, you can see the difference. This is off and this is on. When these lines go more towards the outside, it means that more saturation is happening. And we probably have just a few little spikes here that are... Uh, what may be considered illegal for the uh, Rec. 709 color space. Because this has already kind of got a warm vibe to him, the way that it was color corrected, this is just bumping up the saturation ever so slightly to match the previous shot right here, which because of the way that the highlights were pushed, um, helps to match that just a little bit better. And so again, this is another case where this is not a highly stylized grade. We're not doing that blockbuster cinematic look where we have super blue shadows and warm highlights and midtones. We're not doing day for night. I'm not doing kind of a war look here. 
um, a bleach bypass, something that's really gritty looking. This is basically the color correction punched up, right? We can't consider this color correction because I already did the color correction. That's right here. This is this node right there. Without it, ugh, it looks terrible. That's not good. Color correction only gets it so far though. The rest of these steps here take it from okay looking to something that's really quite nice. So now that you've seen this natural color correction and how you can use it for a feeling of continuity and to help tell your story, it's now time to take a look at a more stylized approach, which is coming up in the next lesson. Natural color reinforces story, but sometimes you need a stronger touch. Stylized color is a strong cue for your audience about the kind of story they're watching. Strong color grading can do a lot to create the tone of a story, and it helps the viewer suspend disbelief, but it's very easy to go too far. In this lesson, you're going to see some examples of some more stylized color grading. So a few of these examples you've already seen, these first few here, but I want to break some of these down so you can see exactly what goes into creating these. What are the types of steps that are involved? Now, different color correction software is going to need to be approached in a different way. Resolve works one way, the tools you may use in Final Cut, Avid, Premiere, Speedgrade, After Effects, they may work a little bit differently. The concepts are all going to be very similar as far as where you're attacking the image, but the process may be slightly different. Now here's a little clip of a uh, limpy leg here. This could be a lot of things. What I saw this as is uh, a zombie, right? I and I wanted to match this to The Walking Dead. So here's my quick color correction. It was very basic. It was already pretty well exposed and white balanced. And here's my Walking Dead look. And just like we talked about before in the evaluating color and imagining a look lesson, I put together some reference images from the AMC series, The Walking Dead. I'm not into zombie uh, culture or movies or television, but that is one of the most fantastic presentations of that sort of genre that I've seen. And I wanted to emulate that. And so that has a somewhat naturalized look, but there is this kind of a little bit of a desaturated, kind of high contrast, gritty sort of look. And so to create that, it was not too difficult. And I'll show you exactly what went into making that happen. So first was a little bit of a warming here. If we look at this node here, just a little bit of a warming overall, because that kind of zombie look is a little bit more warm than it is cool. You don't see a lot of strong blues. So tried to warm this up a little bit. Then the next node here, this was a desaturation. I took the, the saturation down by almost half. Then in the next node here, what I did is I isolated all of the green stuff by using this qualifier tool here. Well, it's most of the green stuff. You can see that all the green foliage here is selected and basically everything else is deselected. And then what I did was I took the hue of that and ever so slightly push that up so it's a little bit more of a yellow. Now this is, I admit, <laughs> this is not easy to detect. But if you look, it's just a little bit more green here with it off. And then with it on, it's a little bit more towards yellow. And the idea was I wanted to make the foliage look a little bit more brown and dead looking. And so I could have desaturated it. Right, I could have taken this and just reduced the saturation, but as I did that, it didn't quite get the vibe that I was looking for. So instead, I took that selection and I changed the hue overall to something that was a little bit more yellow. Then in the next node here, this is giving a little bit of that kind of crunch mid-tone contrast look, and that's achieved by this mid-tone detail right here and a few other adjustments. I juiced the highlights. I pulled down the midtones a little bit. Um, this midtone detail is in Adobe Lightroom. This is called clarity. And a lot of image manipulation tools have this sort of thing. It takes the contrast in the midtones and anywhere there is contrast, it accentuates that, but not globally. It's mostly in the midtone range, I believe. And so it, it kind of creates a little bit more perceived 
sharpness and it really gives it that kind of gritty look. You can see without this, it looks a little flat. And with this, it's like, it's punched way up there. It looks very cool. And then finally, the last node is a little bit of a vignette to draw your eye to the middle of the frame because that's where the action is. So this is, I wouldn't say a super stylized look, but it is definitely stylized. The colors are being desaturated fairly heavily. Everything has kind of a brown and warm tone to it um, to give it that zombie look. I think it works pretty well. Now here's a clip of some soldiers walking. So in this first node here, I'm doing a similar thing to that zombie look where I'm basically selecting the greens and trying to pull most of the saturation and also pushing them more towards this beige color here. The next node is warming things up a little bit. The third node is doing a global kind of desaturating. The greens have already been desaturated a little bit, but this is kind of generally giving it a nice desaturation overall. This next node here is giving everything a little bit of a mid-tone crunch. It's also being warmed up a touch. Uh, the mid-tones are being pulled down a little bit and the highlights are being bumped just a little bit to give it just a little bit more punch and pop. And then finally, a nice little vignette here overall. And this creates a really nice looking kind of war look. Really desaturated, lots of brown tones, mid-tones here. Now I did the same sort of thing on this beach clip here. So again, this is the this is the base grade, but I wanted to come up with a look that could potentially cut potentially cut in between that look with the soldiers. And so this is what I came up with. It's a lot of the same sort of elements you can see. Things are warmed off a lot. A uh, good amount of desaturation. It's got that mid-tone crunch. And if we cut back and forth here, I think you could reasonably say that those two could go together. They have a very similar sort of look. And then finally, I want to show you what goes into creating something like this, this day for night sort of look. Sometimes this can be a real challenge depending on what the footage is. And sometimes it's kind of a drag and drop sort of thing where you can create a look and then just kind of drag it on here. In this first node here, this is a little bit of desaturation. The second node here is a little bit of reduction of contrast. Then the third node here is this big honking correction here with this curves here to basically reduce most of the luminance right out of this shot. This next node here is giving our main little walker guy just a little bit of a window around to basically just bump him out just a little bit. It's very, very subtle. I didn't want to do it so drastic that, you know, it looked like he was being lit with a spotlight, but I did want to just paint attention to him. And then finally, the real magic here comes in this very last node here. And there's probably a better way to do this, but putting this together, you know, sometimes you have to be a little bit creative in how you solve these problems here. But what I was seeing is this looked really dead. These tones looked pretty good, although they could probably be brought up a little bit um, in the highlights perhaps. But water, when it has this kind of foamy stuff, reflects a lot of light. It catches the light, which is why it kind of looks white in the daytime. In moonlight, I was thinking it probably does the same thing. So I created a little bit of a Luma mat. I'll show you here, um, which is basically just sucking out the brightest stuff. And then I also created a mask so that it's only really getting this stuff in the water area. And the effect is that it basically punches up the brightness of the water here. That's 
that's a little over exaggeration there so you can see what's going on but I pull that down to kind of normal ranges where it was before it does a lot to help sell this look to make it look like the moonlight is really reflecting off what's going on there I probably could have done the same thing for maybe his white shirt and a few other elements over here but I thought this worked pretty well for a really quick day for night look now I also did a, a day for night look on these soldiers here in a very very similar way this is obviously much more heavily tinted but a lot of the same ideas here to create this look a lot of shifting towards blue like I said before it's not always easy to pull off a look like this I think this works okay but it's not I don't think it's great it works until uh, the camera cuts up towards the sky and it's it's quite difficult depending on the type of footage to make a sky look dark when it isn't dark Coming up next is the last lesson in this course, where you are going to learn about some tips for practicing, the essential skills that you can work on developing, and how to find work. So check that out coming up next. In this final video, you're going to learn about tips for practicing, essential skills you can work on, and how to find work. First, let's talk about practicing. You know, anytime you start something new you need some material to work with in order to develop your skills and you may be thinking well the only video that i have to work with comes off my mobile phone and that may not be the best material to use for grading although it's better than nothing you can find some better material if you look around a little bit one of the resources that you may find handy is looking around on the web for folks who have done video camera reviews Many times I've seen reviews for RED cameras, Ari cameras, Blackmagic cameras, even Canon and Panasonic cameras. They will have links in the review to the raw footage that they use to test the camera. And this can be a great opportunity for you to get raw footage from high-end cinema cameras or maybe cameras that you haven't worked with before that are ungraded, that are in a really nice picture profile, maybe a log picture profile. They could even be raw files that you may find to work with as well. You can also sometimes find some example footage right from the manufacturer of the camera. So just go to Google and type in your favorite camera and then test footage or review footage or download footage and you'll find what you're looking for. Another tip that I would have for you is to know exactly what your color grading tools do and how they work. For example, you may see on a color grading plugin or tool that there's a shadow slider. But what does that actually do? Is that just a narrow band of shadows? Is that all that it's adjusting? How far up the luminance scale does that actually affect? So one thing that you can do is to use a gradient ramp from black to white, a horizontal gradient ramp. All you're looking for is a gradient ramp that goes from black to white horizontal. Now when you put that in your editor or your video grading tool and you pull up a vector scope and then you start manipulating some of the color tools, you're going to see exactly what those tools do on the vector scope. It gives you the entire luminance range and you can see very clearly what the highlight slider does, what the exposure slider does, what the shadows and the blacks and the whites do what the primary color wheels do and all the other tools it's a really great way that you can figure out exactly what those sliders do knowing exactly what your tools do makes the transition from the idea that you have in your head to actually moving the sliders on screen a lot faster because you're not doing so much experimentation of oh, let's push this slider up and see what it does and pull this down and what does that do and now oh, let's correct for this because that slider affected too much of the midtones or the highlights or whatever now let's talk about how to develop some essential color grading skills one of those is to be a really observant viewer of tv and movies and one of the tricks that i use is to look away from where the cinematographer or the director or the editor and even the colorist wants you to look so a lot of times if there's a scene say with two people and they're talking the normal thing would be to watch the people talking to look at their eyes to look at their mouths to look at their body language but what i've found over the years is if you look in the background of these scenes if you look at what the people are doing if you look at the rest of the scene that's not dead center or slightly to one side of center 
that reveals a lot about the production. You can see, for example, a lot of times when vignettes are used, if you are kind of looking away, looking at around the edges of the frames, look at some of the background objects, the foreground objects, what's going on in the walls, that can really help you see what's going on. Maybe they're using some kind of selective color or selective blurring treatment or something like that. It can really help to look at things in the highest resolution possible. And what you want to make sure is you're watching something with pretty high bit rate. So Blu-rays are really good for that. DVDs are not so great for that. Um, a lot of online streams give you pretty good bandwidth. If you're watching something that's maybe lower bandwidth, some of those little intricate details, what they might be doing with sharpening or blurring and especially grain, those get blurred away. You can't really see them. So when you're watching something with that critical eye, you want to make sure that it has a nice high bandwidth so you're seeing all the detail that you can. Another thing you can do to both practice and develop your essential skills is to go through the steps of creating different looks. Like you saw in the previous example in DaVinci Resolve, none of those were a one-shot deal. None of those were a preset that was applied. You'll see a lot of that in the applications and the effects. You'll see the day for night preset. Um, you'll see the bleach bypass preset. You'll see various other different presets. Those may be okay to get you close or point you in the right direction, but a lot of times, really good color grading takes several steps. And it's important to go through those steps to figure out how your application works in color grading and what you actually need to do to get to the end result. Let's say you wanted to recreate a zombie look like I showed you in a previous lesson. One thing you'd have to know is that in order to key out those greens, they have to look green. So you can't desaturate the footage first and then try and pull a key on those greens or do some kind of selective color adjustment to those greens because the greens will be much closer in color to the rest of the scene. So when you go through the steps of trying to recreate those iconic looks, whether you like them or whether you don't, it doesn't really matter. It gives you a lot of insight into the steps that you have to go through in order to achieve a particular look or to solve a particular problem. Now, let's say that you've practiced up and you're ready to go out in the real world and try and land a job and uh, get a little money for your hard work. How do you find work in color grading? Well, that is a little bit of a mystery even to myself, but I can share with you a little bit of my own experience in finding work. First, you're going to want to put your name out there, right? Get a basic website together, put some demo material on there, maybe a little bit of a reel if it's not strictly color grading, but you want to get some work as a colorist here and there, make sure you have some examples of coloring on there, color grading, color correction, whatever it is. Make sure that's on your site and your name is out there so that when you reach out to other people, you can point them to the site because they're going to say, do you have a reel? And you better have a reel. You know, have some examples. They can be basic to start, but get your work out there. Get it on the web. Get it on YouTube, Vimeo, whatever you want. But make sure you have a basic site. Make sure it's presented well, nice and clean, and make sure that your reel is easily accessible. Now, depending on where you live, finding local work may be a possibility and it may be, in fact, impossible. The first place I would check is to see if there are any post-production facilities in your area. Go there, meet them, talk to the people, show them your reel and say, look, this is pretty good stuff and I want you to see it. And I think I would be a great fit to help you in this project or if you have any work, I'd love to take a look at it. So look at the post-production aspect of things, post-production houses, editing, motion graphics, any place that does that is a good place to start. You can also look at ad agencies in the area. I know in my area, there are a few ad agencies. Some of them have their own built-in post-production facilities. Sometimes they're large, sometimes they're small, but ad agencies often will hire out post-production companies to work on video projects. And so a lot of times they'll know audio people, they'll know motion graphics people, they'll know people who shoot and uh, you know do the full production. They're going to want to know your name too. So make sure you get in touch with somebody there, whoever handles that, and put your name out there as well. And also, don't be afraid to exploit your own personal network. You know, talk to your family, talk to your friends, put it out there on Facebook, post your work to social media so that people can see it because Believe it or not, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, a lot of them have jobs. They work for companies. And a lot of those companies 
produce video or they go to an ad agency to produce video. So if they know you and they know your work is good, they're much more likely to think of you when they're in that meeting with the higher ups that are making those decisions. So when you meet new people, when you're being introduced by your family, friends, neighbors, or relatives, and they ask you what you do, you're going to tell them. And maybe you're going to have a business card and you're going to hand it to them, point them to your website, tell them what's there and what they can be looking for. Because maybe they aren't looking for a colorist or someone in the post-production world, but it's likely that they know someone who does, or they've met someone who does. And if they don't know you do that, then they can't recommend you. Most of my work comes in word of mouth. I know someone who knows someone or someone recommended me or someone fell through and they need someone to step in and get this project done. I know for me, a lot of work comes in that way. I don't have a whole lot of work that comes in from people randomly stumbling on my website, but I do have work that comes in from folks that I've talked to before, people that I know who can recommend me, who know that I do good work. And so self-promotion is not a bad thing. You don't have to be ashamed of it. Get your name out there. Let people know what you do. Have a good presentation online. Have a nice looking reel to point people to. And you will get work. I live pretty close to a medium-sized city and three hours away from Toronto. So I could be working in the real world a lot more. But almost all of the work that I do is from my office, which is right over there. An 11 by 11 room with my whole video production suite and audio production suite in it. And there are times when I don't even leave the house for two weeks because all my work comes in over email and on the web and I just work in there. Occasionally, I do get to leave the house and I do get to go work for our ad agencies and post-production facilities and go on shoots and you know meet and greet real human beings. But don't discount the fact that If you get your name out there and you find the right connections, you can work from home and you can make a good living at it. And with that, you have come to the end of this course. I hope you have found this course interesting and enlightening. I hope that I have revealed to you the secrets and the mysteries of color grading. If you want to find out more information and further your learning on color grading and color manipulation, post-production, make sure to check out the other courses right here on Envato. You'll find great courses on video editing, motion graphics, After Effects, Cinema 4D, color correction, and color grading. So make sure to check that out. Thanks again for checking out this course. My name is Dave Bodie for Envato, and I'll see you around.